Good morning, everybody. Welcome to my channel. This is Kimberly with Journal Breeze. Thanks for stopping by. Well, I am going to share with you today this journal that I just finished yesterday, or day before at night, and um, I, I'm just so in love with it. I just can't hardly believe I made it. <laughs> it's uh, you know, it's got that feel of a of a real French book. But the truth be told, <clears throat> this is a wonderful printable that I bought from the Journalosity Shop, Sharon's Shop, and I printed it out and copied and cut it down to fit within these. Oh, let me turn this light on here. There we go. To fit within these gold pinstripes that were already on the cover. Isn't that just amazing? This is a 1930s book on Michelangelo. It's written in German. And it, it was a beautiful book to begin with. I bought it in a bulk situation. And I've been saving it because I love the color so much. And so, you know, what could be more perfect than this cover in this book? I mean, amazing. And then I put a piece of <clears throat> indigo here sticking out top and bottom and um, and this is one signature and I, I tied it up this way because I love the angel scene so much that I did not you know want to cover it but it's a alligator mouth for sure and um, I like it I like it tied like this I think it looks pretty and easy to do <clears throat> it actually slips off so I made this as a writing journal, and uh, so there's a lot of pages that don't have any anything on them for that reason. But honestly, I thought there'd be more. I just got carried away. <laughs> so I'll take you for this flip through, and it should be pretty quick, given what I just told you and all. Let me have a sip of coffee. <clears throat> it's really early here for me to be doing a video, but I needed to squeeze it in before my day begins. I want to tell you real quick that we have blizzard warnings in our in our newscast. Friday and Saturday, we're going to get snow so low that you know it doesn't happen here. You know, 50 years apart, maybe we get snow on the ground this low. But the thing is that all the mountains around me are going to be snow capped, and up in Big Bear, which is a ski resort not too far from here. Um, they're going to get 72 inches, and they normally get 59 inches in a whole winter season. So it's going to be freezing cold. It's going to be blistering winds, 50, 70 miles per hour. And we here are going to get a ton of rain. And then again, another bunch of rain next week. So we have moved out of the severe drought. We're into lesser drought. And, you know, who knows, maybe it's going to even get better here. But snow falling in Southern California, not in the mountains, is just, <laughs> it's a fun thing. That's what I can say about it. It's fun, you know, because it won't last long on the ground. But, um, but very scary, and people are having a hard time staying warm, and it just feels like we're back in, you know, the Midwest or the East Coast. So, yeah. So here we go. Do you love what I did here? <laughs> this is another fabulous book cover. Let's see if I can get even closer for you. This is another fabulous book cover. I added my own. This is a piece from a magazine from um, Liz Perel, I think her name is, out of... Uh, <clears throat> you know, Somerset Magazine, Somerset Studio. And uh, it's because the picture, the thing I noticed that's really weird about these French book covers, because <clears throat> I bought a ton of the paper version, and um, I, I want to buy a book, but I have yet to find one for sale when I get there. If anybody wants to sell me a French book and not charge me an arm and a leg, please get in touch. I really want one, preferably blue or green as opposed to pink or black or gold. Or white would be fine. Um, but, 
so often on these beautiful covers, they have on the front part a really a death scene. You know, it's it's taken from some aspect I'm sure of the books writing, but it's a, it's a it's somebody dying or somebody being sick or something that's really unappealing and. I don't want to have it. So that's what this was. So I covered it with this. I felt like it, you know, kind of went with the feeling. It's the Madonna done with beadwork and some embroidery. So it, it's been saving it for a long time, and I thought it, it would fit there nicely. And then I had this gold paper that I had bought as an independent scrapbook paper um, in my stash. Yeah, it's the same on both sides. And it, I felt it was a better beginning feel than this. I love this, but it just, it wasn't the right color. It just didn't really happen. So when I realized I was going to make it a writing journal, I decided to put it into a hardback. And when that happened, this no longer would be the cover. But I think this would be a beautiful cover. And Nick at the Paper Cameo, it's put in a very cool centerpiece that looks like a uh, zigzag um, spine. And so really, it would just be a standalone cover and maybe a little decoration up there. But when I added this incredible book cover, who is from Souvenir de la France, it's a single buy from her. It's not in one of her kits, so you'll see it easily. I just fell in love with it. So what I did was, the inside of this book was in great shape. It was that beige paper, and actually I really liked it. But because this was so fancy, I ended up backing it first, because it was going to be smaller than the book. Um, I backed it with uh, Tim Holtz cardstock so that it looked kind of, you know, it's got this pattern, which to me fit the, it, this is a very French, even UK looking pattern, sort of blue on gray, it had remnants of the tape. It just fit the feel of this. And so I put it on the back and then I put this on and made it into a pocket. I actually <clears throat> sewed the signatures into the spine and I had put another spine underneath, you know, to secure it. So, um, so yeah. So, even though there's no other signature that you can see the middle, I did it sort of off to one side so that the spine would show. I like it. I like it. And you know what? I can add another signature if I want at some point. Um, I'd have to do it with um, elastic. <clears throat> but uh, it's certainly an option for me. We'll see. I just love this so much. And then I put... An envelope. I have a lot of envelopes in here because then I can put stuff I want in the envelopes as I go along. But I left them empty because I want it to be as flat as possible. This is from uh, the Paper Cameos um, William Morris kit, which is named something else, but it's in her fall collection. And I just love this so much. I added these leaves from one of her ephemeras that goes with it. And... Um, it sticks out a little bit here. Oopsie. Oh, well, I'll do that later. It does go in easily. <laughs> I don't know why that took so long. And back here, I put in um, one from the kit that this book is mostly made of. This is from Something Blue. It's two kits, the papers and the ephemera. And this is just such a beautiful kit. It's in these shades. And you can see I copy dyed the paper that I did this on. And I just think it's gorgeous. So I wanted it to <clears throat> be available and to stick out a bit. And I, I just love it. And then I put lace on two pages. This is another page from the kit that I just love. It's got the vase in the middle and I'm going to make it the centerpiece in the other something blue journal that I'm working on right now that is on white paper and not on coffee dyed. So it's a little more formal. This is a little more casual in my line of thinking. And I just love this picture. It's from Ruby and Pearl. And this is another um, wonderful envelope from the kit. So I'm not going to say the kit constantly. Just assume. <clears throat> but I love this indigo. This is very much what you saw in the early 1800s. Way pre-Civil War. Way pre-1850. Um, this kind of indigo was really even in the 1700s. And that's my favorite time period is. Uh, 1775 to 1830. That's my ideal fabric, ideal pictures of fabric, which these are. And um, a lot of what you call wallpaper is really fabric. 
and then wallpaper would copy. And also fabric would copy from wallpaper. Um, and that was because a lot of the people that had money in that time frame would have their room, their bedroom, for example, and sometimes their living area, um, en suite, they called it. And that meant that all the walls and all the fabrics on the bedding and the uh, bed hangings and chairs uh, that were in the bedroom, and sometimes then they would do it in their dining room or their living room, depending. Um, but they would all match. They would all be the same toile, because it happened really frequently in France and in England. Um, and stripes were big also. And uh, so this kind of thing could could be uh, on the walls. This generally was too dark to be the whole room. They would do like a white, you know, non-bleached would be more creamy and white would be bleached with a monochrome print on it, which would be a toile of some sort normally, or a stripe. So it might be a blue or a red or a purple um, or a green. And they were just beautiful rooms, especially in the toile. Oh my gosh, just my favorite. But this indigo and white was a very, very hard to expensive fabric to make. It required a lot of time. And so it had to have more dips into the indigo the darker the background was. And indigo was an expensive plant and an expensive dye that was extracted from the indigo plant. So um, so I love seeing copies of that as well. This also is indigo. This would probably be printed and then be dipped a number of times to get these shades of blue back at that time. So again, expensive to make. And this is a lace that I found in that box that I discovered in my storage area that I showed you a um, picture of last uh, last video. I love it. So I used it twice um, because I, I don't really like to lace up every page. That's just not my style. So I used it in, on pages that, again, another indigo, um, very much faded indigo in my stash, don't know who it's from, and um, it just sort of, I thought, with this beige background, really just finished off these two gorgeous pages. Love them. And this is my favorite, favorite in the whole book, really. <laughs> I love it. Um, this is <clears throat> the coloring of this this was a, a, a green got, that got faded to blue because the yellow faded uh, more quickly than the green. Green and yellow made blue dye. So this colorway is the, is the early 1800s because of the fade pattern. And the red is a turkey red, which was real. And so it didn't fade very much. And so you get this kind of blue-green with the red, and it's just so beautiful. And I love these delicate spray ferny things up here. This is so elegant and just so indicative of fabric um, in that time span. I love how she, Nicola, you know, made the made it really raw here so it was on this background. This gray and white beautiful floral is also a, a, a fabric that you see. Yeah, like this whole thing is what she has laid this on in the um, printable. So it's just beautiful. It's just stunning. It's accurate. This could have been a rendering on paper uh, that would be followed then by the by the block print people for both wallpaper and fabric. But because this is faded, you know it was fabric. And then this is a beauty, again, from the late uh, 1700s, this bow type of fabric. Uh, again, used on you know walls, used on bed hangings. It's a very large scale fabric, and um, they used to put fabric on the walls back a long time ago uh, because they wanted to cover the walls with something to keep out the drafts. So fabric on the wall was not unusual in lieu of wallpaper. And this is a faded. Also, and you can see the registration where they used the block print, and then it didn't quite get into where they had taken the resist out of the red dye, which is turkey red. So this is just exactly how they looked in the 1700s. Um, you know, even early, even the registration being off was very, 
much a part of what you would see when they were learning block dyeing in the 1700s. And it was around in the 1600s, too, but not this colorway necessarily or this design, really. Love the detail of it. Mm, just love it. So this is my favorite. Don't know where I got this in my stash. Okay, so we'll start at the beginning. <laughs> Oh my gosh, going in order doesn't really matter to me in case you haven't noticed. All right, so um, love this. Just so much detail. Look at this detail. Look at it. Beautiful fan. Just a beautiful replica. Just looks gorgeous. <clears throat> and this is a, um, you know, a die cut. And then I put a see-through paper behind it. So depending on what is behind, it picks it up. But I just love it. Love it, love it. And um, this actually, the wings come up. But now that it's been stuffed down there, it's not doing that anymore. Fits down in there. And that's, everything is really from Nick's kits, unless I tell you otherwise. This is the other side of that paper. You can see how faded it is. Oh, I just love it. And this I've showed you already again. It's all on um, coffee tea dyed papers. Oh, I guess I had something here. I got these rusty um, paper clips, which I love. Uh, Rust is a must, I think is the name of her store. Just so beautiful. So realistic looking. I love again how she's made the edges raw and laid it on top of something else, which isn't new, but it's a beautiful combination. This I tried putting, um, tried something new, putting some glassine paper. This isn't actually a bag; it's a sheet of glassine, and uh, then put these wonderful hearts inside. Coffee dyed. And I actually didn't tape it, I glued it, but it looked a little raw at the top. So I put the um, put this washi across the top. And this is a stamp from, um, uh, I wanted to show you the thing, from Sam Pool. And... Um, my intention is to stamp every blank page in here. And rather than do it all in advance, I thought, well, I do a lot of writing, so I'll stamp, I'll pick the stamp, um, you know, when I've written on the page or know where I'm going to stamp and write around it. I just, I think it's fun to kind of stamp as I go along. So that's what I'm going to do. And this is called a pillar print. Again, 1815, France and England. Um, just love this tea dye background is what it was called even then. And um, again, turkey red, the fainted, the faded bluish. This green has stayed more intact than this. So they might have put in less yellow on purpose to let it be more blue. I don't know. And then there's birds. Just love it. Don't know where it came from, though. And this is one of the envelopes. Again, this wonderful background. Love this. And I filled it with some, I think it's uh, Roxy Creations, Rachel's Papers. So I can write in it. I don't intend to steal it. And I just love it. So I added this bit of transfer paper here to emulate what's going on over here. It's a little blank down there. I felt the pages a little dull. Um, with, you know, I just felt this added, drew them together. Let's put it that way. But I love the page. Love the page. And this is a, a black blank for writing damask. I tried to find where I got this. It was a while back. Um, but she is on Etsy. I'm assuming it's a she. And not, not not a name that I recall, and I promise I'll put it in the description box if I can locate it. But you might be able to find it on Etsy. This is from the kit. I felt they went together well. This is uh, an envelope that I 
you can tell I love this so much. I really can't use too much of it because it just it's just so beautiful to me. So I don't know if I'm going to write in here or just use this as a beauty spot. I don't know, but I made it an open tuck. So here we go. This is a small version of a large piece from Nick's earlier blue kit. Um, this is a tag I made, and then I, this is a little pocket that I added. Uh, I like the color that she used for this green, and I felt like it really went well with this. So that's what I did. And this is another beautiful, I don't want to take it out right now, but beautiful, gorgeous, again, very early print, 17, late 17, early Oh no, this is a brown. This is these tea dyed backgrounds are in the 1800s. So this would be you know 1815, 1820, 25, something like that. Anyway, I love it. And um, I showed you this page already. Such a cool picture. And again, I don't know where this came from. These are long in my stash. I added these wings to this girl and this is from the kit and this is another one of the blue kits papers made small so it would be a writing spot. I don't know if you might think that's silly. I don't know what, what got into me but <laughs> I just did it. It was late one night. <clears throat> This whole thing is as is is in the kit. Oh, what can you do to make it better? Nothing. <clears throat> and I loved how this shape was so similar to this. Squish down thing. This is from Digital Fit. And I just think they're great together, so I didn't want to do anything to them. I might, you know, tag a piece of paper later that I write on. Not sure. Not sure. Sometimes just the beauty is enough for me, and I don't need to do anything to the page. I don't know what got into me, but I really love these heart patterns here. And they are writable. And here was the string I couldn't get around. So I thought, well, you know, maybe I can make them more, <laughs> more cute by sticking them in there. Making the string more cute, I mean. This is the other side of the envelope that I showed you before. Again, leaving it open. This is a stamp from Sam's latest kit. And I wanted this side to show here because it emulates this. And that really hangs together for me. And then this is the other side of this great page. This side and this side. So you can see the lace here and the lace there. It's just a beautiful page. It could be a center. Um, just love how she just made it look scrappy. I just love this kit. I think it's one of the best kits she's ever done. I know I say that every time. They're all so spectacular. <clears throat> but I really love this one because it's in blue. And I wanted this pink to pick up this pink here. Obviously a portrait. That's in the kit. And this is another one of those pages. Both sides are really great. Whoops. This is uh, another stamp from Sam's kit, <clears throat> which I put in upside down. <laughs> and another page that I made small. I've talked about these. This is from one of Nick's other kits. I just love it. I think it really picks up the design here. Other side of that beautiful tea dyed print, palm tree and partridge were a very famous pattern. You saw them done many different ways, but they're called partridge and palm tree. Very, I have some real ones. Oh my God, the real deal. They're just beautiful. This is just one side of a tea dyed bag, that glassine bag. And I just, I don't know, the color was perfect, tea dye, tea dye. 
I don't know what I'll do with it. Maybe I'll stick something in there. I don't know. I wanted to leave it flat because I can't write if it's bulky. And I prefer to write just on the paper. I know I can use a board if needed, too. Love this paper. Unfortunately, I put it in upside down. <laughs> okay. And this is in the kit, of course. And then this this um, envelope I made in my antique envelope video from a while ago. Or, you know, make your own reproduction antique envelopes. And I love this shade of green. And it went beautifully with this. And then this picture of this woman. I think it was also in one of uh, Heather's kits. Um, it's got a green background. When I cut it out, it really showed up green. So I was going to put it in the center of this circle. But it was I was going to cut it to fit, more or less. And it was just so green to me, it did not go. So... This fan is beautiful. And I thought, well, so I glued it down because she's got the weirdest base. And so this just looks, looks like a dress, so it worked well. And then this is from Chapter 1 Papers, and I felt the green and the pinks <clears throat> also went really well. And then I put a um, tea-dyed, very thin paper back here to just kind of bring the pages together. And then this incredible envelope that I made. And I love it. It's one of my favorites. So I made the whole thing. I glued on a variety of different things to um, give it this look. And I coffee dyed it first. And it's a like a CD envelope that doesn't have a CD cut out. So I don't know. It's kind of a nice treat to take it out because I actually forgot about it already. And then that shows up. So I don't know. I just thought it was a cute cute thing and I really was happy to use this very early possibly Italian possibly English possibly French but I made it French one franc I try to keep things true to themselves at least on the page but I try to do it through the whole um I need to sit down a minute hold on <laughs> Oh, I have my seat covered with this adorable find. I got this from um, Goodwill. Oh, oh my God. The focus completely. Oh, I hope the focus has been staying on for you. Look at this. Isn't this adorable? It's very long. They called it a, what, a table runner? Well, there was two of them, but one had a little hole in it. This one didn't, so I bought it. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna cut it up and use it on the front, uh, you know, maybe over the spine or whatever, and bring it over part way. But I also am going to cut up sections so that it can be like a pocket inside. I hardly ever find textiles I like at Goodwill. Or no, it wasn't Goodwill. No, it wasn't Goodwill. It was uh, uh, it was an independent charity charity shop. This is the other side of the pillar print. You can see the bird more fully. Oh God, this journal makes me happy. And um, this is a cute little paper clip that came with something that I bought, and this was cut out of one of the side pieces that Nick had in, in one of her fall kits. You know, she does the half circle oval shaped tucks. And so I cut that out and this is one of her envelopes from her Christmas kit. And then I put a cute little button thing that I made with really old buttons inside. I was so happy to be able to use this. I am working on my buttons, people. I am really into buttons. And I intend to make a bunch of them to sell. So I'm having fun coming up with things. And uh, I will let you know. And then I added this since you saw it last. This is um, Eyelet Vintage or Older. Beautiful. Beautiful. It's all 
Oh, it's hard to tell, but it's gorgeously. Let's see if I can get it out of the light more. Whoops. It's all sewn around every single petal. Oh, it's just a beautiful eyelet. And um, I know it's by machine, but still, it's so pretty. And then a button card, my own button card. And then, of course, my Tiffany stamp. Oh, my gosh. This was the first stamping of it, so I didn't do a great job. But it doesn't matter. It's supposed to look old. I have a funny story about this, though. <laughs> when I stamped it, this color was remarkably like what the real Tiffany color is. I, my glasses are Tiffany. And see that color blue? That's the Tiffany blue. The tips are Tiffany blue. And uh, the front's not. It's a tortoise. Um, I really do love Tiffany things. So this stamp, I got it from uh, Lorna at TaylorMade Stamps. She made it for me, even though it wasn't out and about at the time I ordered it shortly ago. And then the stone, which I love. And it's about communication and creativity. It's got a funny name, like uh, Alkalite, something like that. And it's really trendy right now, which I didn't know because I liked it before that. But I went to buy it at a local crystal shop, and um, they really didn't have the what I wanted. So I got this, which I've made friends with, and I love it. Can you see the variation in it? Isn't it beautiful? And then there's some gold in some of them. Not so much in this one. Anyway, um, so the funny thing is, is this color came out quite aqua. And I was surprised because the stamp cube that I used was Tim Holtz denim. Faded blue, it was called. I thought, wow, I don't know. Maybe it's so old it's changed colors. But hey, I was not complaining. So the other day, since I did this, um, I brought out that blue again. In fact, I used it throughout the book. All of the things I stamped were in this color. But I had it upside down for some reason. And on the back of the faded blue, it said evergreen. And so I had inadvertently switched caps at some point. So I dug around in my stamps, and there was the evergreen color, which, of course, is more like this. And then the faded blue is more of a navy. So I will continue to use evergreen with my Tiffany stamp unless I use gold or black or something. So that was so funny to find out after. Like this is also the evergreen, but looks Tiffany. <laughs> I put this circle inside of here of this woman. Um, I think this is uh, Vintage Scraps Crafts. Or... Could be out of Jane, or it could be Ruby and Pearl. You know, they're all good, all of them. And then these stars or hearts, I mean. Uh, put gold around them, turn the edges up because it was such a pretty paper. And I put Tiffany down here again. And this is uh, left over from this, so I might use it at some point for something. But it also. Uh, lent some stiffness so that these would stay in a little bit better. Didn't really want to use uh, clips because, again, I'm trying to keep it flat. I showed you this page and the lovely lace. And I showed you this page. And then the back. Um, this is from um, Joyful Crafting on Kofi. <coughs> Love it. <clears throat> and then this is uh, um, from one of Nick's kits, Nicholas kits, gold paper, and I showed you the back and the wonderful envelope that matched the paper and the back. So there you have it, my beautiful writing journal, which I will use and write in. I write a lot when I journal. I'm not a daily journaler, and I don't write about what I did. I write about I write about what I'm thinking. I'm writing about um, 
<clears throat> you know, what's going on that matters to me. So it might be in the world, it might be in my town, it might be in, in my home, it might be inside of me. Um, documenting isn't as important to me anymore. It's more about uh, philosophy and spirituality and um, my thoughts on something um, as compared to another time in my life or um, my thoughts on something as compared to a friend or somebody else or what I got from somebody else and, and I want to write about what I learned from them so that it's enjoyable for me to read it back. I, I, uh, I find that journaling is a really critical and important part of my life, <clears throat> but it has changed depending on where I am in my life. You know, it, it, it's, uh, you don't have to do it the same way all the time anyway from day to day, but you certainly don't have to do it the same way through your whole life. As you grow and as you begin to see things in a broader perspective, which comes, I believe, with age, if you think that way at all. And then you end up um, understanding things so deeply and, and so much more uh, outside of yourself. You know, your, your awareness is just broader and wider and deeper and greater, I think. And I love, love, love that kind of um, conversation, that kind of movie, that kind of thinking, that kind of book. And so I'll write about books and, and how they impacted me. <clears throat> I occasionally watch a movie, so if it's meaningful, I'll write about that. So so I write a lot, and, um, and I find it very fulfilling. I feel like I should remind you that I, I was a contributor to actually two books on journaling, uh, but the one that was for the public, the other was a textbook. Um, it's called The Greatest Book of Journaling, or The Great Book of Journaling. And it's edited by Eric Maisel and Linda Monk, two very internationally known writers and journalers. And um, Eric Maisel is a creative creativity coach. He's a um, prolific writer. He's written so many books on so many areas of self-improvement and self-development. And he and Linda are friends, and they're both on the board of the International Association of Journal Writing, which I've been a member of for many years. And um, Linda is the director of that and also uh, has written other books on journaling. So, you know, journaling is really a friend, and you can do anything you want with it. Um, so if you make a writing journal, it doesn't have to just be quotes. It doesn't have to just be um, a little quip about what you did that day, you know? A travel journal might be, but a, a journal that you keep about your life and how you're thinking about things shows how you've matured and and um, increased your depth. And, um, you know, that's not important to everybody. I get it. But for those of you it is, think of using these journals like that because they're beautiful to keep. And then you can look back and you can hear yourself at that level of thought, which can make you think even more as you're reading it, more growth or more depth of understanding. Anyway, that's my bit. So you can get the Great Book of Journaling on the shelves at Barnes & Noble and through Amazon and, and a lot of other places as well. It's such a great book. All the big wigs, really, and I'm not saying I'm one, but all the big wigs in journaling have written a chapter in that book, and um, I'm just honored to be among them. And uh, all aspects of journaling are talked about. It's very reader-friendly, very quick chapter reads in terms of the way they've divided it up. We had to divide up what we wanted to say. My chapter is called Contemplative Journaling, and I talk about um, combining meditation and journaling. But the thing is, doing it in the, in the fashion that I talk about, your journaling after is very different and very brief, and tons of poetry has come, in, come out of me by doing what I've called contemplative journaling. And so there might be some poems in you. Um, mine are often about history. <laughs> There's an example of one in there that happens to be about the Australian earthquake that happened, or New Zealand earthquake that happened, um, what, five years ago or something? Three, four years ago? So there's a, there's a wealth 
within each one of us that can come out through journaling that doesn't start in your mind. Let's just say that. And that's why it can be so different than the type of journaling that a lot of times, you know, we're doing in our journals, which are kind of brief and about something that just happened. So I hope I've maybe piqued the interest of some of you. And um, if you have any questions about it, please ask. If you want to talk more about it, please ask. If you want to learn more about the book, go to Amazon or Barnes & Noble online. Or you can look back. Well, I didn't say too much on my wall about it, actually. So it was published uh, in June of 2022. All right. So have a wonderful day, you guys. Um, it's been a joy this morning having my coffee with you. Take care. Bye-bye.